So, thank you for having me here. I think we, oh right, now there's a hole. Uh, this is the after lunch talk, so, so I hope you're ready. Because I, I want to take you places you probably don't really usually, you, you don't go, uh, because you're, 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 you're from a different sector, so to speak. I, I just need to announce, I, mean, I don't know if there's any engineers in the room. Do we have any engineers in the room? There's a few engineers. I have to say, it's not personal, but engineers are probably the most arrogant people I know. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not personal, sorry about that. But, and they're also the most kind of nice people to know because I have, if I have a problem, I'll call my friend the engineer. And he'll probably come up with an answer I can use in my plan because, I mean, engineers are detailed and structured and they know how to, to fix things. So, so communication is interesting also that you can call the right people and announce the right things and then get kind of a, a progressive development in the future. I'm from Samsø, which is a small island in Denmark. We won a competition to be the Danish energy island back in 1997. Our then minister, Mr. Sven Augen, he went to Kyoto to the third COP meeting in the world. At Kyoto, he announced that Denmark would cut down 21% of the present CO2 emission. 21%, that was, a, that was a very ambitious target and he was not really kind of popular when he came back. Industry said this is going to be really expensive. I mean, this will be kind of a threat to competitiveness in, in the world market because I mean, now we're going to pay a, a really heavy tax, which we do in Denmark, or, or carbon tax and stuff like that to achieve these goals. <clears throat> but this minister was kind of sturdy. He wanted to do this. So he called a community, like a competition, to find the place in Denmark that would commit to this process and be 100% self-supplied in just 10 years based on local commitment, local ownership, based on present policies and funding schemes, and also based on today's technologies, I mean, proven technology that was out there also for, for this, this change. So this was kind of the starting point on this project. And if you were the community of my island, what would you think that kind of a minister would announce that you are now going to kind of fulfill his ambition about cutting down CO2 emission and committing to 100% sustainable energy in just 10 years? I mean, my community was just as quiet as you were now <laughs> when they heard this, because they think if we keep quiet long enough, it'll probably pass and go away. <laughs> it's something from Copenhagen and it'll probably never really apply on this island. And so let's just pause it and wait a little bit and it'll just probably disappear like many policies are changing all the time. We invented a new word for it. We call it commodity. I don't know, you probably already saw that. I couldn't spell the English language. But commodity is a construction of common plus community. So the commons is a very old word for uh, land shared by a community. The commons, administration of the commons, you have heard about the tragedy of the commons. The commons in general is, was a valuable asset in the old days when private, uh, private ownership was not as kind of actual as it is today. So common administrated by community must be commodity. Do you agree? So let's introduce that as a new word in the English language. Let's see what happens here. So to be a sustainable island, sometimes you think that a sustainable island is maybe, it could be a metaphor for what we want to do in the world, but maybe it's also like to sustain an island means also that we keep the island alive, you keep the community alive and you work with the community as kind of a living structure. So you could say that the surrounding is kind of the organized structure and then the island has this kind of this little difference that makes it an island. So how do you keep that little difference when you talk into kind of a, a, a governance and, 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 and national policy? When we talk about challenges, climate change is one of the bigger threats. It was already 20 years ago we talked about climate change. So security of supply, well, we were heavily import, importing oil. We were so depending on oil. And you could say oil prices in 1997 was about $30 per barrel on the world market. And 20 years later, or no, 10 years later in 2008, it was almost $130 per barrel. So you could say that being very dependent on imported oil, we could see our economy kind of just go berserk if we didn't do anything. So the change from imported fuel to local produced fuel would kind of change the economy uh, totally. And then industry, economy, and jobs. It is a tough deal to keep jobs in local communities. If you have a successful company, what happens it will either be taken over or bought by a bigger company and moved to the city. This happens all the time, and we are very creative in local communities. We have to, 
we have we have to find new ways to, to survive. But as soon as we kind of become successful, we, we will export the know-how to the city. So this is a big challenge. This is the system we are operating in. You could say that the Danish energy system is really complex and very well functioning. It is connected to Sweden, Norway, and Germany, and therefore we have something we call the North Pool. So everybody is feeding into the same system. It's wind, solar, biomass, coal, gas, whatever we have available is fed into the same system and organized by uh, an electricity distributor, and, and it's working super eff efficient. We, we never have blackouts in this part of the, uh, of the world. And this is also policy driven. So policy makes us able to connect to the grid, which means that if we want to make business and we have a plot where we can put up some wind turbines, we are by law allowed to connect to the grid and thereby we can be electricity producers and connect to this also. So this is a possibility we're working on in the future. We know we cannot do this ourselves, so collaboration between sectors is really crucial for this to happen. So we cannot say that we are independent from everything. No, we are not. We are very dependent on the surrounding communities, and we want to talk to them. We want to be part of the process, and not to own it and run it, but to be part of it and be kind of a, a, a what do you call it, a successful developer. But because of the connection, we'll be a stronger developer. The system is it's an operation, and by this, in 10 years, we became 100% self-supplied. So it happened over, I mean, the first five, six years, we actually did the whole transition. We have 11 onshore wind turbines, 11 megawatt capacity, we're producing all the energy we need. We have 10 offshore wind turbines, we're producing all the energy that goes into transportation, or offsetting CO2 emission from, from trans transportation. We're grid connected to the mainland, so we reduce the CO2 emission from the production in coal, coal or gas-fired power plants uh, from the mainland. So this is, this is happening. We have district heating instead of oil furnaces in houses and so on and so forth. So when we do the math and the whole calculation, we have a minus 3.7 tons carbon emission per capita on my island. So we, we've succeeded in this. So we can actually send a report back to the minister that we did it. And then he said that, yes, but you have to do better because I mean, we have new goals now. We want to be totally free from fossil fuels in the future. So we always kind of raise the bar and have new targets to do this. But we proved that if you have a specific focus on change, then change will happen if you have the right conditions and the framework is right for us. This is an investment of about 500 million Danish corner, which is, I don't know, in pounds. It's maybe 50 million pounds uh, worth of energy installations shared by only 3,700 people, which is a kind of very high investment per capita that happened here. And it was all bank finance. It was all financed because of the energy savings from kind of the le then lesser imported cost of fuel from outside. So we could go to the bank and said, here's, here's, the, here's the budget. Uh, can you lend us the money? And they would happily do that because we could actually earn the money by saving import from outside. So the investment profile was less than 10 years payback. So this was all interesting and good. So the, the next, the following I'll, I'll talk to you about is how we then did it. Not so much, no, not so much how, but more why. This is my island. You can see it's, it's, quite, it's quite nice and beautiful, the island. Uh, in the background, you can see there's some windmills. And, and further out in the background, you see there's some smoke coming out of the smokestack. Can you see that on the picture? This is nearby coal-fired power station. So this is carbon dioxide coming out of the chimney. So when we talked about wind turbines here, you could say the reason why, I don't know, how do you, how do you feel about wind power? Do you have some resistance? Do you, do you like wind turbines? You're nodding. Anybody who lives near a wind park who has the wind turbines outside their windows? No? Do you know somebody who? <laughs> Who kind of who's suffering from wind syndrome? There, there's some, some diseases out there because of wind power, low frequency noise and stuff like that. Do you know about that? You've heard about it. So when we talk about wind power, people starting getting worried and and concerned about the impact of wind wind power. How do you then address this to, to, to local people? So you could say that when we have this smoke stack where carbon dioxide is coming out, and we have actually three power stations surrounding my island. Then the argument was to say, we put up these big wind turbines to ventilate the smoke away from the island. So these are not wind turbines, these are big, huge ventilators to keep the environment clean and the air nice and, and breathable 
in, in our part of, the, of this little island. So it makes kind of sense that we do this because of other reasons that just to make money or to produce electricity. We do it to compensate for the CO2 emission. So this was a very binding argument. The other argument was to say, we want to share this with people. So if somebody developer wants to make a wind project, which is very often happening, that we have a developer, he'll search the area for a good place to put up wind turbines, really huge, big wind turbines or solar plants. Some of you are from Germany, right? And, and you have some, I mean, when you drive down the highway, you see big solar installations on the sides there also. These are development projects or developer projects, not so much involved with local people. We said, if we don't involve people in this, so this, the, mid, the central turbine here is owned by people in shares. So we offered a share to everybody who lived nearby the wind turbine. So if you could see the wind turbines out of your window, you'd, you'd be offered to buy a share here. And you know what happens? I mean, you probably also heard about birds being killed by wind turbines and all these really <coughs> sad things. When you own a share in a wind turbine, all of a sudden this wind turbine becomes much nicer to look at. <laughs> it sounds so much better. It has this kind of this sweet sound of money in your pocket. <laughs> and all of a sudden there's no dead birds around it anymore. <laughs> and this low frequency noise disappears completely. It got, it's not there anymore for some reason. I don't know why, maybe it's a deep psychological insight in ownership means also kind of understanding why and accepting the conditions. We now have wind turbines because I'm part owner. It's a totally different attitude than if you have a developer from outside who just earns the money and runs away with the profit and you have to suffer from all the consequences of the wind turbine. I mean, I have a little story about the wind turbines. Sometimes we have visitors from Japan, not quite often actually. And the Japanese visitors are very, very polite, very uptight, very polite. And at the end of my, my talk, they very often have this question for Mr. Hermanson san can you, can you please explain us how do you deal with the bird problem? I said, the bird problem, what do you mean? Yeah, it's not so good with all these dirt birds around the wind turbines. All oh, right, I got that. <clears throat> we have an, uh, an appointment with a nearby restaurant. So we send the, the young waiters out every morning to collect these uh, sliced birds, and then we kind of turn them over and fry them. We have this uh, lunch recipe <laughs> for bird kill. I mean, do you want to do you want to want to have this? And the Japanese are like, this can't be true. And I said, to them, no, it's not true. It's not true. There's no dead bird. But I dare you, if you we can go out to any of the wind turbines. If if you want find one dead bird around the wind turbines, I'll pay the lunch. And if they still don't look con convinced, I'll say, and the beer. <laughs> and when we get out to these turbines, you see 12 Japanese running around looking for dead birds. <laughs> it's such a convincing argument for people who don't like wind turbines that you can't imagine how often we hear these things here. So ownership and the reason why is, is very important for this to happen. We, if we have that solved, people tend to like them. They're here because of a reason. <clears throat> so we used all these technologies and, and we did it in a good way. The first turbines, the first district heating made money so we could invest in the next projects. Because we are not a rich area, we are a low income area compared to the rest of Denmark. So how, do we, how did we finance the development? We did it by earning money and putting the profit into kind of an investment fund. And this investment fund paid then for the next installations. So, I mean, when we got through the process and erected these big guys here, and they were starting to, to, to produce uh, and sell energy, we then said to the municipality and the local citizens, we now have a new project, a new process portfolio where we want to use the electricity locally also. So we put up electric chargers and we bought a lot of electric cars. So we are now driving, we, we have the highest amount of electric cars per capita in any part of Denmark. And this is all financed by the, the first production. So <clears throat> how do we define that? You probably know the word sustainability. It's heard very often. Everything can be sustainable. You can buy sustainable stuff everywhere. But, but I think we should translate it a little bit different. It's about being able to sustain. So this ability is really interesting. How do you make people able to sustain their community or their business or their interest or their house or whatever it is? So this capacity building is about how to sustain things. So we, we, we use a lot of energy in education and how to inform people about what the next move is. What is the smart move for you to do? How do you define yourself as a matter of who you are and where you live? Kind of sensing the place, because it means something that you are in the right place when you do the right thing. If you're in the wrong place, then the right thing can be totally wrong. 
But you have to combine these things and sense the place, which means a strong, sustainable and robust community must share locality, activity and mentality. Kind of the latter, the mentality part is maybe interesting to talk about. How do we define that? Well, this is my island seen from Google Map. So you can see that it's the longest island. In the south end, you have the civilized area of the island and, and the central part of it that you have the capital where we have the municipal town hall and the mayor's office and the banks, the downtown, the Wall Street and red light and this is where the roaring, <laughs> oh, it's not that big, but uh, it's a nice little place. And then you have like in the middle part, you have like a lagoon. It's a big nature park where we try to protect migrating birds from everywhere. It's an international migrating birds reservoir. So nobody is allowed to do anything there. Then you have the north part, which is a little kind of almost an island. And you have a very isolated community there where people speak a different dialect. There's also a lot of inbred families there. They're a little bit different <laughs> in their construct. And They've been isolated for many years. Also. I don't know if you know that also from where you come from, the people on the other side of the river or the, another region. They are a little bit different. <laughs> you know the feeling. I can see that. So, so from this little island, I have to say I live on the south end of the island. <laughs> the, the bottom line. <clears throat> of course, that means something. But every year, they, the North End people, they invite the mayor's office to come up and have a meeting up in the North Island. And they complain every year that they think that too many decisions are centrally decided from the local, local government side. It's only 15 kilometers from there to the North End of the island. But it tells you something about democracy. It doesn't reach out very far be before it becomes bureaucracy and administration. And you don't feel involved and included in the decision making. So democracy is a vulnerable thing. I mean, we are now in London and Brexit and the European Union. So, so, I mean, you all know about that. Democracy is a vulnerable, difficult thing to talk about because if you don't, if you don't feel included, then it becomes bureaucracy and system administration and not so much commitment and direct connection to this also. So we try to talk ourselves into that also on this island and say to them, this is not one island. This is many small communities and we want to cooperate and work together. This is Denmark. Have you all been to Denmark? So you know Denmark. On the right-hand side, you have Copenhagen. It's almost in Sweden. It was the capital of Denmark when Denmark was all of Sweden and Norway. And I mean, Denmark was a big country once. Now it doesn't really make sense that it's all the way over there to the right, where you can see that my island is right in the middle of Denmark. You see that? So we are the center of Denmark. We know that it's very sometimes hard to convince the government that we are the center of Denmark, but you can see that obviously I, I made my point. So this is the European Union. You can see with the new members. It is not Brussels or any other way. Samsø is the center of Europe. Here's the world. And as you can clearly see that <laughs> you probably thought that where you came from was the center. It is not. This is my island. But of course, it's seen from my perspective. And the, the point is that sometimes we become too, too kind of global, too multinational, too everything, and, and not really focused on where we come from or where we are. So the, you have the UN Sustainability Development Goals, uh, and you have many other things here also. And it's worth for um, kind of commitment for the whole world. But then it comes to the individual. How do you then commit to this? process or to this ownership? Do you feel that it, it applies to you? Or is it just something that we are talking about on the top level and it never really complies to where you are at the local level? So I think that the translation or the joke about this is that how do we bring important messages? How do we bring important targets into kind of action where you come from in, in your own local region and your own local community? I think that is one of the biggest kind of challenges we have right now in the world. Because everybody can talk about it at a global level, but it's really difficult to bring it down to a local level and bring it into action. So let's work on that. We have common ground, but many different reasons to be there. Common ground is, again, the UN Development Goals. We have the climate. We have many things here we want to solve and work with. But we have many different reasons to do that. And quite often, we kind of separate ourselves in cells of, of common interest, cells of what they call it, uh, equal people. So, so the different reasons to be here is not so easy to discuss. 
In a little community like my island, we have to discuss that because we have to meet the opposition on the other side of the table. When we have public meetings, you have like these loud mouths shouting opponents to a green transition and development, and you have the other side also people who want to save the world and don't have the means to do it. And, and we have to have these arguments. Otherwise, it'll happen outside the room. Let's get inside the room. <clears throat> so this quote is basically focusing on that. I have to read up from here. Strong leadership is a vital component in any successful pioneer project. The paradox is that change is the work of love, but the driving force in the realization is love walking hand in hand with power. So I don't know how it is with you. So over here I can see maybe more power people. Or do you have any old hippies in the room? <laughs> We have a hippie over here. So this is the power people and this is the love people. <laughs> so, so of course, we drive things because of passion and because we want things here also. But we also kind of realistically know that we need to be in business to make things happen. But we have, if we can walk hand in hand with the, with the vision and the dreams and the, and the future's perspective and then realize it in cooperation with business and, 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 and the whole structure over there, then, then I think we'll be successful. But quite often we see conflicts in this also, and you see people protesting and being angry about the differences here. And I think it is time to do more kind of consulting in merging the two sides and make us work together. The vision is there, but the ownership is maybe not. When we create a common sense of ownership, the road is open for development. And I will read for you again. In order to realize a pioneer project, the project participants must assume ownership of the project's main purpose. I mean, not the real project, but the main purpose is interesting. By creating ownership, people accept a common vision for the future. Without ownership, no united approach, and without a united approach, no change can be created. So this united approach is, is, is where the big job is. How do you unite very different approaches to things here also. And I think that is kind of what we have achieved and why we have become famous. That's because we united the approach and we kind of made a common direction. Everybody could appreciate and say, yes, we will go that direction. We'll do our utmost to, 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 to be successful because we need it. We need to work together. And then we kind of, kind of cut the edges a little bit and say to them, it doesn't have to be all my way. It can also be a little bit somebody else's way, but all together we'll meet kind of common successful development of the future. We create what we call kind of a burning platform. We talk to ourselves about why do we do this? What is the driver for this to happen? It's maybe kind of prosperous kind of future business and stuff like that, but it's maybe also the fear of losing your job or losing your, your, your structure, your family, your house. And, and the threat could be <clears throat> if we don't do anything, then in 10 years to 20 years time, things will be so different that we can't really live here. So what if we think in 10 to 20 years time, we'll want to see the changes happening in front of us and then roll it back and backcast to today and say to them, to be able to be 100% self-supplied or be kind of sustained, we will have to do this tomorrow and this in three months time and this in three years time. It's kind of like a business plan for communities. When we gather people around this business plan for communities or this burning platform, all of a sudden we start to talk about the purpose and not so much about what's in it for me, but maybe more the common purpose. And then we can connect with what's in it for me afterwards. <clears throat> we have learned that when we meet people, we need to meet them where we kind of commit to the process. So in a meeting like this, I have the floor. I, I can talk uh, now for as long as I'm allowed <laughs> by the organizers. And then you can go home and you can think that, oh, I like that, or I didn't like that, or this was boring, or whatever. So, so in, in, in our new way of meeting, we try to organize people in new meeting forms so we connect people more. So we put people up in big circles. And then we have the purpose in the middle. We define the purpose and set up the agenda and agree on the agenda in the middle of this. And everybody talks to the agenda. So we don't have one speaker. We have many speakers. Everybody who is participating in the media meeting is potential speakers. And they'll speak their mind about their opinion about this, this, uh, this um, purpose. And then we can go home with the feeling that everybody connected to this and everybody is now part owner of the process. And this is a whole new feeling about ownership and it's so much more fulfilling than having meetings where you don't really know if you're connected. You can see there's a few connections here, but the rest of the people, did they actually like it or not? Or are they going home? 
kind of not really considering what to, to, to do about it here. Also. So new meeting forms is really interesting that you can connect with a different purpose. This is very early pictures. This is the mayor, the tall guy on the right-hand side. You see, he's not really looking very convinced. I mean, he was a farmer, <clears throat> and he didn't really know what to think about this project. But he probably thought that he'll get a lot of European funding and a lot of national funding to do this project. So let's do it. He, his purpose was not, I think it was not really kind of heartfelt. The guy in the middle, he's, he's the local trade and business uh, chairman for the association here. He had, a, he had a plumber and kind of a workshop, and he could do all the district heating, the foundation for the wind turbines. He loved the project because he could see the potential. There's a lot of work here. And the other guy is the organizer. He didn't really think much about it because this is just more work. So, so this was the beginning. We put up a few solar panels. But gradually, we kind of learned from it, and we invited people to participate. The openings of things here, we celebrated. We drank a lot of beer and a lot of coffee every time we had a new project because it was kind of a reason to celebrate every, every time we had a successful uh, development. And we became more and more brave. So we engaged with jack ups and big investments and infrastructure pro pro projects that was much more dangerous because we didn't know anything about what we were doing, really. <clears throat> but we successfully developed these things here also, maybe because we did know that we had to call people, experts from outside, to come and help us and do these things here. So the, the development kind of is to say we want to go this way, but we need, to, we, we need to find out who we want to walk this walk with. So these guys are investors. You can see that these are local hillbillies and rednecks from my island. Many of them I know very well. So we invited them to come and invest. We invested uh, almost 240 million, uh, what is that, 24 uh, million uh, British pounds in offshore wind project. That was the biggest investment we made and really, kind of dangerous for us. And so we put everybody in a bus and said, let's go to the factory where they produce the foundation for the wind turbines. So we can see this big steel construction. This is the foundation. And we put, everybody, put a hard hat on everybody so they became very important business guys. And we walked around in the factory, and you can actually say that we, <clears throat> good stuff. <laughs> let's, let's buy 10 of these guys. And you can see how people kind of grew by, by doing things here also. They kind of straightened their backs. and. You see, they became more important. We are now in business. So we had to, when we entered the bus to go back, they had to go sideways to get in there because they were really, uh, we were now in business. We were important people together. But doing this together and kind of risking our money and doing the project, we also kind of grew a confident trust that we could do more. We were actually able to develop the country or the community despite the, the differences in, in a successful development, which led to kind of a, a local ownership that was not only ownership of the wind turbines, but it was ownership of the development and also ownership of the future, which I think is very important. If you can talk about the future and then do th things that will step by step lead you into the future, then you can also trust the future. You probably see a lot of communities around the world that doesn't really trust the future, who's, what, what, is, what is going to happen out there. If you want to develop and change, it's important to meet people where they are. So <clears throat> in, in the development, we are very often approached by consultants from outside. And they want to help us. Well, they want to have our money in other ways. If we are not ready to, to ask the question to the consultants, they'll give us the answers before we even ask the questions, and which, will, which, which might lead us into diff different directions that we don't really and we didn't really think about it. We didn't think that that was our main direction. So <clears throat> when we get people together, it's very important to talk into kind of a local context where we know each other and we, we are dealing with the real problems. So when we talk about UN development goals, num number seven, affordable, clean energy for everybody, we talk about who will, will anyone invest in it? Who is going to own it? Who will take the profit? Who will take the risk? What is, the, what is the impact on the environment? And what's in it for me? I mean, we're talking about basically how do we change this vision to be a business case that I can be part of? And then invite people to go to their bank manager and say to them, I want to have a huge big bank loan and part participate in this project. And you need to be convinced about that also, because if you're not convinced, he'll never give you the money. So the investment comes from this comfort and trust that we can actually make our own uh, destiny and, and make it possible for, for us to be there. When we talk into this also, we talk into culture. 
I mean, you know the Viking metaphors from the Scandinavians. I don't know if it's about being the happiest nation in the world. I mean, for some reason, it's Finland the last one or two years. It has been Denmark for a long time. I don't know what happened in Finland, but they took over this, uh, the most happy nation in the world. Have you heard about that? Do you believe in that? <laughs> you know, Oprah Winfrey, when, when Obama, he visited Copenhagen, she was following him, you know, the talk show, show, uh, talk show hostess, and she wanted to interview the most happy family in the most happy nation in the world. And they found a innocent family in the north part of Copenhagen and interviewed them. I don't know how, what came out of it. But it's kind of ridiculous. But I think it's about trust. So kind of taking kind of the joke out of it, the trust element is interesting. In the Viking period, Denmark was all of England. It was all of northern Germany. It was all of, of the Baltic area and Finland. So Denmark was a huge, big country then. And who, how did they lead that country? I think they led it by trust, maybe also a little bit force and violence and other <laughs> lesser important things. But I think the myth is that they were violent and, 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 and cruel, but I think the reality is that they were really good in, in trusting each other. That if you trust me, I trust you, and we'll help each other, and we'll develop this. So we believe in having local leaders, and we trust them with the leadership of how we want to develop this also. We don't have central organizations kind of sending out messages in, in a, in a top-down structure. We'd like to share the ownership and we like to base it on trust. So this is a new area of development. How did these guys, I mean, the Vikings, first they came to England and I think the Vikings, they made London. <laughs> <laughs> then they went to Ireland and then they made Dublin and Cork and stuff like that. So then they made them because they wanted to make business. They were trading stations. And you could say, how did, they, how did they do that in these open longboats? They even went to, um, to Newfoundland, these guys, many, many years before Columbus and all the other guys. So an experiment doesn't have to be perfect. Experiments can open the way for something radically new. I mean, what would you be thinking if some captain said to you, let's go west, <laughs> start rowing, and then you sail all the way uh, to America in an open boat? Somebody must have been thinking, let's see what's out there. If we don't have a look, then we'll never know. So let's, let's trust each other and go all the way over there because the birds are flying that way. So they must, the birds are not that stupid. They would probably not fly to a destination where there's nothing. So there must be something out there. So an experiment is leading to something radically new. It's interesting that you actually trust each other to do something you haven't done before. That you go ways that nobody has walked before. I think that is really, really interesting in this uh, perspective. We also know we cannot walk this walk alone. So therefore, we're also very interested in getting our next network active or activate the next uh, contact person or the, or, the, or the next capacity person in, in this evolution. So we reach out all the time. We invite people to come and visit us because we know this cross-breeding uh, cross of things here is, is important for us. If we don't reach out and talk to other people than ourselves or the already convinced people, we won't learn anything at all. So we see a lot of different people in our process. Like for example, one guy from Colombia. Do we have any people from uh, South America? There's one person up here. We have a guy from Colombia, Manuel Manga. And he's, he's a Colombian. He's a really Latino person. He's very, kind of very nice. <laughs> I like him. He came over and he said, I'd like to talk to you about what you're doing here because I have a center. He's a professor at Stanford and Harvard and Berkeley and many different things. He has his own institute for evolutionary leadership. And I mean, so, so we thought, we immediately felt kind of in contact with him because we thought that this is what we have been talking about for a long time and he's now describing it and he's describing the competences for evolutionary leadership. So he's using this to train and teach business leaders all over the world in his institute for evolutionary leadership. So maybe you should study that. I think I can only recommend you to talk about that because when we talk about restriction, we know what we don't know, and we can describe what we need, and then we can actually reach out and get it. And I think that is so imp important in the, in, in the development. Find the blacksmith is a metaphor for leadership. If, when we talk about leaders, we are not talking about kind of the presidents or the prime ministers or the leaders or the CEOs. We're talking about the informal leaders. In a room, there's always somebody who is kind of have this natural leadership in him or her who can actually stand up and do things and kind of walk in front of a process and, and, and 
help it and nurse it so it can grow. So how do you find these kind of these informal leaders in your in, in your in your myth? And I think that is a very important thing also for a local development. For this, we also need education. So the Nordic education system is basically <clears throat> like any other education system. I think the difference is that we have something we call the folk high schools. The folk high school system is a system where you actually take time out of your life. You don't have a curriculum. You can go to a school, one of these folk high schools, and study a subject of your own choice. And you can actually be good at something. It can be singing, painting, drawing. It can be rowing, parachuting, whatever. It can be many other things. It can also be philosophy or whatever you like to do here. These folk high schools has, for the last 200 years, been kind of the cradle of creativity and innovation in Scandinavia. And I think that is maybe one reason that we trust each other so much, that we allow each other to have these open, kind of open areas where we can go and study other sides of ourselves and not just be specialists in financing or in engineering or in, in other subjects here also. So, so the complement of your other side or your more creative side is really interesting. New communication arises when you allow yourselves to be stupid, lazy, and yourself, which is maybe the folk high school system, that you allow yourself to go out and study life and do it kind of in a relaxed way. You don't have to pass exams, but you do it because you want to develop yourself. So we, I've been kind of quoting from a pioneer guide we have developed as a, as a tool, because people are very often ask, asking us, how do we, can, is this scalable, this little island? Can we actually scale that at all? And once I had a visit from the Egyptian ambassador, he came to Samsø and visited us and he said to them, how can we, can we use this in Cairo? Can we do a Samsø in Cairo? And that was a difficult question. So I said, them, maybe if you do it one block at a time. So, so, so scaling is not so interesting, but inspiration is maybe more interesting. How do you, how do you inspire other places to do what you have done? And how do you get inspired by projects you can see around the world. So we're trying to do that with this community here. <clears throat> I, I'll skip a little here, because this is, uh, I already talked about it. How does it, how does it work out there in the world? I'm, an, I'm now a mentor in a program in Canada where we are addressing this project. I've now been there for four years, and every year we educate 25 communities, all from east to west in Canada, off-grid, uh, native communities where they are suffering from high oil prices and lack of energy and lack of resources in general. And the provinces has kind of a treaty where they have to offer for, for, for very cheap, uh, what you call a very cheap uh, cost for local citizens. And it, the expenses on giving them fuel and, and keeping them alive is really, really high. So the deal is with the provinces that they, they will keep on paying for this, but gradually will change the, every community here to be self-supplied with renewable energy. And therefore, they'll eventually save the cost of keeping these communities alive. They kind of, they ice, ro ice truck, uh, they fly it out to these communities. You can imagine how expensive it is and how polluting it is also to have these little diesel generators idling around in all these communities all over, across Canada. So this is not just a small place. This is a lot of communities. And this is not just happening here. It's happening in Indonesia also. We have 17,000 islands in Indonesia, 250 million people all based on coal. We are working there as well. We're working with communities around the world where we are trying to make them self-supplied. So the SAMSA scale project is, is there now. We have the European Smart Islands Network. More than 300 islands is connected to this uh, project, and we try to develop this. And this is not just small islands. It's also Crete and the Canary Islands and Madeira and some of the big islands, Sardinia and Sicily, um, and trying to do that in a, in, a, in, a, in a more sustainable way. Sustainable development is a long haul, but together we can do it. We have been part of a process where we now have a, a political program or a framework in the European Union talking about sustainable communities. And they have been kind of more and more politically decided to go that way and finance projects around in the European Union. The next thing is, is uh, energy for transportation. I mean, how many of you are driving electric cars? None? So you can see how advanced electric transportation is. Um, I'm not trying to kind of mock you or anything like that because it is not yet kind of, kind of normal for people to drive electric cars. We have an electric car at the Energy Academy. It drives about 230 kilometers on a full loaded battery. So that's 
enough for islands driving, but if we want to go to Copenhagen and back again, it, that's not enough. So it's, we are not there yet. So we are trying to work out new programs for transportation. Living on an island, we need energy for tr heavy transportation. We have ferries. So we have bought a new ferry. So this ferry is a biogas ferry. It's already there. We bought it three years ago. It was commissioned and, and produced in Poland. It's a 220 million pound ferry. It's a hybrid ferry, so it, it's producing electricity. All the propellers are electric driven. And then in the hull, they have, it has a gas generation facility producing the electricity for the propellers, which means that we can produce, all our waste can go into a biogas incinerator or bi biogas digester, and thereby we can produce methane and put it into the ferry and drive the ferry with our own waste. So this is kind of a future project. We see it many other places also where you have trucks and lorries and public transportation is on biogas also in other countries. But, but this is the future. We can, we can deal with two things also, that we don't waste too much, we don't produce waste, and we can then use the fuel for ferries, and then we'll, we'll solve two things here. Actually, when we announced this, you know, biogas for ferries, the joke on the island was that the toilet compartment would be kind of a separate, they, they would have a, a system. <laughs> yeah, you can imagine how it works. So the captain would say, this is the captain. <laughs> we have a little headwind today, so if we want to reach the harbor in town, uh, we need everybody <laughs> on row, seat number this and this, to go to the toilet now. <laughs> we need extra power, because this is virtually what it is. It's methane from, from digested biomass that is working here, and it is working. Um, so this ferry is uh, already announced. This is our crown princess and her daughter announcing, giving it uh, a, a, her name, and it's really, really good. The ferry is super efficient, it drives without no so sound. You can't really hear it because it, it's electric propeller, so it's a, it's a very, very safe and good, good ferry. <coughs> Commodities is equals biodiversity and people. So in my talk, I have been trying to stress that what we do here is not so much about technology. It's not so much about financing. It's about finding that the diversity of people who can do this, who can make this happen, and invite them to participate practically and directly in the process of change. And then, then we have this activated level of civil commitment in this also. And this is also activating not just people, but also finances and resources and energy in the, in the perspective. Because this, this public or this people's energy is really, really important for this to happen. When it comes to kind of the bottom line, it's about bread and butter. How do we create a community that is self-sustained, where we every year create new jobs and we every year generate kind of the possibility for young people to come and establish them? You probably, I don't know where you came from originally, if you all come from big cities, but some of you might have come from rural areas, from little towns and places outside uh, the cities. How many of you are rural people? Oh, not so many. You're mostly city people. So you don't really give a damn about the rural area. <laughs> because the rural area is really important because I think in the future we need to be friends with the rural area. Because that's where the food comes from. That's where energy comes from. That's where clean water comes from. So, so, so what if we think that the rural area has to be vitalized and, and kept alive? Because this is where all the resources for the big cities is coming from. So, so I think we need to find ways where I think many young people say have a dream about moving. Do we have any young people here who dream about living in a green area with organic vegetables and a healthy <laughs> environment where you, can, where you can grow a family and, and make them happy and healthy? So, so a lot of young people and young families are dreaming about that and not to live in a polluted city. I'm not pointing in any specific direction here, but. Uh, <laughs> but to bring, to bring your family up in an environment. But it's not possible because the jobs are not there. The jobs are here in the big cities. And this is maybe kind of a little crooked. I think in the future we'll look at a more diverse community where we'll create jobs and possibilities for people to establish themselves because this is what the young generation want. They want this change. They don't want this stressed life in the city. And maybe sustainability will come with that decision also when we actually decide to change the pattern and change the lifestyle. So this is me working at work. And I just want to end my talk with a little kind of a little joke. Allow me, because we became very famous because of this project. So we've had a lot of headlines, and you can find, if you search uh, Samsung Island in, in the web, you can find uh, news articles of CBS and BBC and CNN and all the stuff here. I mean, 
actually the joke on my island is that when CNN is, is arriving again, to talk about the story, I call some of the friends and say to them, are you ready to give an interview where CNN is here? Oh, no, not again, they say. I mean, every, everybody else would stand up and, 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 and be there. And especially my ministers will be there. I mean, this, is, this has been kind of one of the things that connect us to the Danish government. Because if Time magazine is, is, is on Samsung and they want to talk to a minister, a responsible minister who was part of this process, and I call them and said to them, are you ready to give an interview to Time Magazine? They'll be there in a sec. I mean, they, they'll, and they'll probably say that, I'm particularly happy to say that I've always been very supportive about this Samsung project, and I think that it's a really <laughs> nice project they've done here, and I'm, I feel deeply connected to this process. And next time I call my minister, he'll be more responsive and, and talk to me about this also. But this is a, a front page of Time Magazine. I don't know if you can see it, but <laughs> up here, there's a little ball here. On the, on the left-hand side. And underneath it says Arnold Schwarzenegger. You can see how small this ball is. I don't know where, you, you know where, where we're getting. <laughs> and down here on the right-hand side, you can see it's almost twice as big as Arnold Schwarzenegger's. It has my name on it. <laughs> so this, I can only conclude that my balls are twice as big as Arnold Schwarzenegger's. <laughs> And, and this has been, this has been, a, this has been <laughs> an advantage in many cases, and especially Americans, they love this metaphor. <clears throat> Maybe it's too many hormones, I don't know. So by this, I'll, I'll, I'd like to say thank you very much for, for allowing me to, to speak at, at your conference. And I hope that you, uh, you uh, had an insight in how we are working, and uh, enjoy the rest of the beautiful view from here. Thank you very much. Be surprised uh, if there wasn't any question from the audience. Uh, we have a couple on the app, though. If uh... right, I should just talk loudly then. Um, we talked a lot today about the E of environmental and the G of, it, of government. You've really gone down the social route here. What? How do you think that the, the deliverability of the environmental social governance agenda is achievable? what I see as social coming through from the retail side of it and the other two coming from the wholesale. Well, I, th I, think, I think it's kind of a parallel process that is happening. If you don't have like a proper governance of things here also and then the political framework that is directly approaching what you call it social activity, then, then nothing will happen because we will be left as ignorant cu customers and we'll do exactly what the market is asking us to do, more or less. I mean, we still have plastic bags in supermarkets. We've been talking about plastic for eight years now. Why, why, why happened, government said to them, we ban plastic from now on, and plastic bags. People have to bring their own carriage or paper. Rwanda can do it. Pardon? Rwanda can do it. Yeah, yeah, there's other countries who have done it. This is just one simple little example that it doesn't really uh, scythe down uh, to, to the social element. So if politicians are not brave, and courageous and determined to do things, you can see the social aspect of it has to be based on social activities alone or what do you call it, uh, idealism or, or activism. And, and that is contrary to what we have promised at the UN uh, uh, Paris Ag Agreement and other places also. So I think we have a, it's, it's a really interesting question uh, and interesting not in a positive way uh, because it, there's, there's kind of a, there's a lock here where we can see it's not really working. And how do we make it work? The gentleman there. Um, can I ask, um, what plans do you have to engage with any communities in southern Saharan Africa? Did you hear the question? What, what plans do you have to, to engage, engage with any communities in sub Saharan Africa? With any community in sub Sahara? Yeah. Region? So a month ago, I was in Johannesburg talking at a big conference there called uh, Power Africa. I think there was 10,000 people at this conference. And I talked to 400 VIPs, which were sub-Saharan country leaders, prime ministers and former prime ministers and all kinds of people there. And you had like the leading, the leading unit of that was America. America was leading an investment portfolio of many countries that committed to this also, to Power Africa. 
and, and to power Africa means that you're looking into the business case about this also. And I was really frustrated when I came back because it's all about coal, it's gas, it's oil from, from, from oil drillings, and it's uranium nuclear power, and it's also solar and wind, but it's everything that makes you tick that is at, at stake here. So what we are addressing is that if we can kind of frog leap the, the evolution here, so you don't build an, another line of big coal-fired power plants, but you actually try to kind of go into the next paradigm of energy development. But the conflict is also here that these countries are interested in growth from now on. And they are looking into the business of their own resources. So if you find oil or if you find gas, as you do in Mozambique, they, found that they, they just struck a really, really big gas field up there. Or you're building coal on top of the coal reservoirs in South Africa. I mean, they're just opening a 1,900 megawatt coal station right, right out of Johannesburg, and the next one is under construction already. So, so we have a conflict here in the world as addressing that we should cut down carbon emission. And at the same time, sub-Saharan countries are looking at gross uh, possibilities, and that'll basically be on fossil fuels. So, so what we can do is that we can inspire local communities in, in frog leaping this and not being depending on external or centralized production and start making their own. But this is, again, we need investment people to, to, to make business cases so we can actually help local communities finance their own energy infrastructure. Otherwise, they'll be customers in the big guys' shops here. All right. Uh, I have a question regarding demographics and how is that linked to the efficiency of your system? Over the past seven years, I noticed that there's been a contraction of 10% of the somethings, so, so the inhabitants in something. So I'm wondering to what extent the system is efficient because you have less people. And to what extent, actually, you know, we know, how would you read that particular note? So you're talking about immigration patterns? Immigration patterns or people, you know, having less people on the island yeah. for becoming more efficient. So we are suffering from, from the same depopulation as any rural area. This is why I'm blaming the cities a little bit for attracting people and <laughs> to go to the city. But on the positive note, we have a, po we have a positive immigration to Samsu. So more people, more families are moving to Samsu than moving away from Samsu. The problem is that many of them are, age, are, are at a high age because they are retired and they, they are not having kids anymore. So, so they are not as productive. They are very nice people, no, no offense. And we love them and they should come more and more, but, but uh, they die faster than the, the birth rate. So, so this is why the population is declining. It's not because people don't want to move to Samsu, it's actually because they wait till they are too old. And, but but I, see, I see a tendency, I see a trend that we have more young families moving to Samsung. So it's better than it was before. Many other uh, communities we are comparing ourselves with is suffering much more from this. And you see that generally around the world in Japan and in America and many other places. It's the same thing. People are moving from the rural areas to the cities. So demographically, that is a big challenge. I'm going to maybe uh, uh, redound on that and uh, uh, give you, uh, for those of you, a question that came on the app. Um, pieces of it you, you probably answered already, but uh, you're probably often confronted to the question of scalability, and you, you mentioned that. Is the united approach in a utopia? And what is your answer to it? <laughs> is the united approach an utopia? Yeah. Hmm. I mean, yes, it's an utopia, but. I'm a strong believer in breaking kind of the law of, of, of realism. I like to believe that if you start a movement, it's kind of a snowball effect, then you'll see this movement happening in many, many other places also. So you're in investment and, and financing, and we have an idea, because we have been in contact with so many communities around the world um, who are thinking kind of in the same direction as we are. So we thought that what if we make Samsung 100 times all over the world? Not to be arrogant, but we call it something else, but some that's a metaphor of, an, of a local community developing into kind of a sustainable uh, future and doing it by their own resources. What we need to make that happen is actually a, a green bank. It's a basic financing where local people kind of safely can invest their savings, their, their money in projects here uh, in, in, in their local community. But they can only do it if they are secured by kind of a basic funding from a green fund or from a, 
funding who, who trust that many, many, I mean millions or thousands of projects around the world would be one big business. So what if we make like a Samsung 100 bank and start this process and believing if we kind of just push the ball a little bit, then it'll start rolling. And I think that you will have a lot of local activity if that was possible. Because if we are, when I'm asking my local bank today, my local bank is kind of constrained by, by uh, the, the bank system, uh, fear of, uh, of bankruptcy and fear of, uh, of, of the financial regression in, in 2007 and 8. So we are restricted much more than we were when we started years ago. So we want to have risk investment based on kind of a fund structure, a green fund structure that trusts that this is a good idea. And then Utopia will be realistic. I don't know if there was a lengthy answer to this also. Uh, absolutely. Um, well, to the others, of course. So another one. Um, which again, I think that you, you, you touched upon in a way or another. Sustainability versus globalization, is that the underlying message? I think, I think it's, it, it, it is so closely connected because we are now one big market. Everybody is uh, trading all over the world and we are moving all over the world also. I mean, not the whole population, but there's a lot of movement here. So the global community is, is, is there. We can't really separate ourselves from many things here also. I mean, I, I remember my Minister of the Climate, Ms. Connie Hedegaard, who used to be the Climate Commissioner of the European Union. She's, a, she's one of my heroes. She's a favorite. She's a strong leader and a very, very powerful lady. But she said publicly that Denmark successfully disconnected growth with energy consumption. And, you know, I couldn't help thinking, yeah, that's fine. But what we did was that we actually decommissioned heavy industry to China and India and other places here also at the same time as we kind of went more and more into IT and, and kind of low energy consuming things here also. So that's nice. We can say that. But in reality, we should add the CO2 emission from the heavy industry in China to our kind of local economy because it's basically <laughs> still due to our consumption that they have a CO2 emission in China. So, so yes. Thank you. Is there any other question? Yes? Yes, one more question. Uh, how do you store your energy? Store? Yes. Do you have any challenges with it? Yes. I've been told that few plants were actually stopped because they don't have uh, possibility to sell it in a time frame. So, so there's many ways of storing. Uh, one is batteries. And I, I know... I mean, I, I'll, I'll go around, I'll come back to your question directly. I just had a report from, uh, from uh, Adelaide, from uh, South Australia, where Elon Musk has, has installed a really, really big battery. And everybody was very kind of very suspicious that this battery was just a marketing thing for Elon Musk and Tesla and the whole thing. And, but, but it has proven to be really, really efficient, this battery, because it's peak shaving. When, when you have a peak consumption, then the battery kicks in and starts feeding back into the system electricity enough so that you don't have to rev up the generators and produce more energy to, to meet the, 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 the peak loads. So the battery is, 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 is a, it's a coming technology, and, and this is a good... Very good test and very good demonstration that this is the future. We don't have big scale or large scale battery on my island, just to come back to your question. We have small scale batteries. We have flow batteries where we charge the, the day production and we can use it in the next 12 hours circle and we can't keep it for a long time. So it's temporary uh, short time storage we do here. We store a lot of the heat. When we generate heat, we put it into tanks. We have a solar production from the daytime. We put it into tanks and storage tanks, and then we feed heat or hot water into the houses in a radiator, a hot water system that is operating there. Electricity is tricky, but because we are part of the North Pool, we feed the electricity into the system. If there's a shortage of water in Norway, then we'll feed electricity up to the Norwegian hydro dams, and we'll pump water back into the reservoirs. And this is not something we can decide in Denmark, but this is a market-driven process where if the prices are low on one side and high on the other side, then it'll naturally run that way. And because we have this North, North Pool agreement, then the connections are paid for by the differences in, in the prices. So we actually have, we have a Scandinavian pool of energy. It's not 100% storage, 
but it's, it's leveling out the ups and downs and the peaks and lows of the energy system. So this is how it's working today. But in the future, we hope that more electric cars and more batteries will, will help us store electricity on a, on a larger scale uh, with the future technology. But we are not there yet.